From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Carol Lombard and Basil Rathbun in That Certain Woman with Jeffrey Lynn. Lux presents Hollywood. Our play tonight is a drama of a girl against circumstance, a girl whose future is ruled by her past but who finally finds a new tomorrow of hope and happiness. Starred in That Certain Woman, produced with great success on the screen by Warner Brothers, are Carol Lombard, Basil Rathbun, and Jeffrey Lynn. Mr. Edmund Goulding, the distinguished Hollywood director who wrote and directed the screenplay, is our special guest, while Louis Silvers conducts our music. Just a word before turning our program over to Mr. DeMille. May I remind you that a beauty care used for the most famous complexions in the world has to be very special. Well, Lux Toilet Soap is. Nine out of ten screen stars use this gentle soap because it has active lather. Lather that removes stale cosmetics, dust, and dirt thoroughly from the pores. Try it. See how soft and smooth it leaves your skin. And now, our producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Halloween greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. This is a night of masquerade when millions of mummers, young and old, don colorful disguises and startling attire. And Carol Lombard also changes her spots. Theatrically speaking, she puts aside the droll mask of comedy and bows to the public in the cloak of drama. Miss Lombard's decision to forsake slapstick for drama may surprise many of you, for it comes on the heels of lavish displays in the magazines celebrating her as the reigning queen of sophisticated laughter. But this Lombard is as wise as she is witty. With a sharp eye on the future, she's sighted the end of the madcap comedy cycle and has chosen the Lux Radio Theater as the opening scene of a new chapter in her career. With Miss Lombard, it's drama from now on, at least for a while. Not only in radio, for she plays a highly emotional role in her new David O. Selznick film, Made for Each Other, co-starred with James Stewart. Carol has, has always shuttled back and forth between comedy and drama with the ease of a truly great artist. Under contract to William Fox when she was 15, she fled weeping with nervousness from the preview of her first picture. Next, she turned up in Max Sennett's boisterous two reelers and then became paramount number one glamour girl with a cinematic sigh for every custard pie she dodged in the name of Sennett. While her screen parts during the immediate future will be more vitally dramatic. Miss Lombard's interests off the screen remain unchanged. These include tennis, which she plays with a tireless intensity, skeet shooting, and the designing of a new ranch in the San Fernando Valley. Tonight, in that certain woman, she's heard as Mary Donnell. Basil Rathbun, who's being applauded so vigorously for his work in the new Paramount film, If I Were King, returns to our stage as Lloyd Rogers. And as Jack Merrick, we feature Jeffrey Lynn the superb young actor who carries off many of the honors in the recent Warner hit, Four Daughters. And now for the play. It's curtain time and star time as the Lux Radio Theater presents Carol Lombard and Basil Rathbun in That Certain Woman with Jeffrey Lynn. New York City, a few years ago, when gang wars made screaming headlines in the daily press. On the streets of the Times Square district, newsboys hawked the latest in a round of murder. Al Haines shot! Gangs the kill! Al Haines shot! Read all about it! In the window of a dingy hotel room, a white-faced girl stands listening, her hands clenched tightly in front of her. Al Haines shot! Gangs the kill! Gangs the shot! Read all about it! Suddenly, the, the girl can stand it no longer. Mary, don't put down the window. Why don't they stop yelling that? It's driving me crazy, Amy. Look, Mary, look, honey. Now, you've got to get a hold on yourself. You can't go to pieces like that. Al's dead, but... Oh, Mary, that's... Al's dead. That's news to him down there. Al Haines was a gangster. He's dead. But Al Haines is my husband. They don't think of that. They don't care. Mary, Why don't... Why didn't he be... quit? He said he would. He promised. Now it's too late. Don't, Mary. It'll be all right. They'll take care of you. He had a lot of friends. No, I don't want them. I don't want their help. I used to work, and I'll work again. Change my name. Funny, isn't it? 
I was so proud when I got that name, and now I have to live it down. Rogers, Tilden, and French, good morning. Mr. Rogers? I'm sorry, Mr. Rogers is busy. Will you wait? Rogers, Tilden, and French, good morning. Oh, yes, the bonds. They'll be exchanged according to the trust agreement. That is, if it's satisfactory to you, it is fine. Goodbye. Did you get that conversation down, Miss Donald? Yes, sir. All of it? <laughs> yes, sir. You're amazing. How long have you been here now? Almost three years, Mr. Rogers. Uh, remind me to raise your salary as of the first. Thank you. That's the second raise in a month. Oh, it is, is it? Well, cancel it. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, better take the... Uh, Take that stuff into your office and type it up, Mary. I'll have it for you in ten minutes. Good. Hello, Mary. They told me this was your office. I've been waiting. What do you want? Don't you remember me, Virgil Whitaker of the Daily Press? I covered the story when Al Haynes was shot. Listen, Whitaker, I have a good job here. Yeah, I know. And I've worked harder than you've ever worked in your life to get where I am now. Nice going, too, Mrs. Haynes. My name is Mary Donald. Now get out, fast. Mind if I smoke? Wouldn't you like to make $1,000, Mary, just for your signature? Now, look, look at this. It's a Sunday series on the old gang stuff. Where are they now and all that? See, my life with Al Haynes signed by his widow. Signed with your name like you wrote it. Only you didn't really, because I did. And I can get you a check today. Now, you get out of here this minute. Lay off me. All right. But when this story comes out, don't say I didn't give you a chance you to... You get cut... out of here. Miss Donald. Yes, Mr. Rogers? Uh, can you step into my office a minute? Certainly. Mary, who's that man in your office? A friend of mine. It didn't sound that way. I heard you ordering him out. It's something I can take care of myself, Mr. Rogers. Mary, you've been with me for three years. We've never once, I think, stepped out of the roles of employer and secretary. Will you forgive the lapse if I ask you here and now to allow me to be your friend? Thank you. You're so square and kind. Being here with you, it's, it's meant so much. And now I'm making a fool of myself. No, no, Mary, you're not making a fool of yourself. And I'm not going to try and tell you now what your being here has meant to me. And so, having exchanged compliments, shall we return to that untidy fellow in your office? No, Mr. Rogers, when you engaged me, I said I was married. That's all right. You were a widow. You knew that I was Mrs. Alhane? Of course I knew. When you were out there at that desk, licking stamps, when you were going to night school, making your own dresses. You know, Mary, there are only two kinds of people in this world. Yes, sir. Us and all the others. By us, I mean we fighters. And now, Mary, who is that uh, lad out there in your office, and what does he want? Oh, it's a relief to tell someone. It's, it's about a series of articles in the papers called Gangsters and Their Morals. Where are they now? He writes them. He's written one about me. I only want to go on and make a life for myself. If everyone knows about it, I can. Right. The whole series ought to be stopped. How? We'll just have to convince that reporter fellow that it's a bad, cheap idea, bad for the whole community. I'll see him now. Uh, what did you say his name was? Whittaker. Virgil Whittaker. Virgil, eh? He doesn't sound so tough. Hello? Hello, Roger speaking. Where's for him? Say, who's this? Jack Merrick. How are you, Lloydy? Jack! When did you get back from Europe? This morning, I think. I'm still a little hazy. <laughs> you sound it. What about lunch? Well, unfortunately, I'm having lunch with my father. Storm clouds are up brewing again. Oh-ho. Trouble in Paris? Monte Carlo. Half a million francs. Yippee! <laughs> Say, I don't want to speak to you anyway. Where's that gorgeous secretary of yours? Uh, oh, uh, uh, I, I didn't know you. Uh, uh, just a minute, Jack. Uh, this is for you, Mary. Jack Merrick. Merrick? Hello? Hello, beautiful. I just got back. We're having dinner at seven. <laughs> Are we? Ambassador Ruth. Still love me? Not yet. Good. Don't be late now. But, Jack, I can't... Bye. <laughs> Crazy fool. I didn't know you knew Jack Merrick. Oh, yes. He spoke to me here one day a long time ago. Uh-huh. Do you like him? I don't know. Yes, I guess I do. You can't help like him, Jack. Now, uh, don't be late. Ambassador Roof at seven. What time is it now, Mr. Merrick? Oh, now, stop. I couldn't help it, Mary. I'm sorry I kept you waiting, but... Ah, oh, kiss me, beautiful. Jack, don't! <laughs> Mad man. You're prettier than ever, Mary. I feel better the minute I see you. You know, I could hardly wait. I waited. Oh, well, I, 
I had to have a long talk with Dad. You know, my first day back and all. I know, Jack. Order your dinner. Oh, I've dined with Dad. Well, did you? How nice. Nice? I was dying. You don't know my dad. I can picture him. It's always been the same, ever since I was a kid. I'd say to myself, I'll just go in and tell him, and tell him straight. And I go in, all set to tell him that I'm free, white, and 21, and I'm going to run my own life. And he'd just look at me, and through me, and my throat had tightened up. You told up. me all this before, Jack. Let's go, shall we? Where? Anywhere out of here. You make me nervous. No, I haven't walked so far in years. What's the idea? Well, I thought it might be good for you. Well, this is where I live. Hey, Tonight... wait, wait a minute. I don't mind walking if you get somewhere, but we didn't. It's no use. Let's forget it. I told you before you went to Europe. Go on. We'd better be just good friends. You're a strange person, Mary. I can't make you out. Don't try. I suppose your private opinion of me is that I'm a sap. No, but I think you could cut more ice in the world than you do, Mr. Merrick. And that's just what I'm asking you to help me do. Help you forget that you've got money, a background, a father? Oh, thanks, but I'd rather not. Now, let me get this straight. I get a small job, we get married, and we... Well, we fight the world together, is that it? Why does it have to be a small job? You're a pretty smart fellow, Jack, a very smart fellow. Oh, when you say things like that, I... Kiss me. No. All right. Mary, I'll do it. I'll live your way. But listen... You know, I haven't got the strongest character in the world. Would you be around to give me a hand? Perhaps if you were on the level. I mean, give me a hand. For keeps, Mary. I heard you. I said perhaps. Good morning, Miss Donald. You mean good afternoon, don't you? What? Is it past noon? Quarter past to be exact. You were out late last night. <laughs> I was. Were you? I was. <laughs> I was with Jack Mary. <laughs> so was I. What? After you were. Uh, he came back to the club. Oh. Mary, you and I took a little excursion into your personal life yesterday, didn't we? Yes, and you were very kind. Well, that man Whittaker just phoned, by the way. He sounded quite human and very grateful to you for getting the new series of articles on businessmen. I'm grateful, too. Good. Look, Mary, if you don't want to answer this, just say so. Um, do you care enough for Jack Merrick to marry him? Yes, I do. Last night, Mary, or rather, early this morning, I told young, Me young Merrick all that I knew about you. You you told him? I dared to take your life for a moment into my own hands. Why? I felt that, well, Mary, you see, I... You'd have to tell him someday. Well, what did he say? He can't wait to marry you. He told me your idea about get his getting a job, and I told him, I, I told him, Mary, that I, that I thought you ought to get married today. Today? And why not? I've said yes for you, but he wants you to call him and confirm it. Oh, but isn't it too much to ask him to give up? What? Oh, all his home and all that money. Money? Huh. I have money, Mary. Loads of it. And I'm one of the unhappiest men in the world. Are you? Oh, you know I am. And my wife has money, loads of it. But that doesn't make her happy either. However, I'm very happy at this moment. Happy for you, Mary. You know, Mary, life is really like a green horse... You pick up the reins, manage it, master it, make it jump, make it dance. <laughs> or, or maybe it's more like a circus, clowns and monkeys and those poor elephants that never forget and never know their own strength. Yes, and the people who swing from those dangerous things up on the ceiling. Yes, but your hands are strong, Mary. You won't fall, neither will Jack. Go ahead. You're the flying medics, and God bless you. Call Jack at the club. Run away together. Elope. Oh, go on, Mary. He's waiting for you. Mr. Merrick, secretary. Hello. Let me speak to Norton Merrick, please. Uh, who's calling? Police Commissioner Finley. Oh, just one moment, please. Hello. Hello, Norton. Finley speaking. Well, go on. Go on. You located your son, all right. He's married. Married? When? Last Tuesday morning. He's at a little country hotel up in Connecticut. Finley, can you meet me right away? Well, sure. I'll pick you up at your office. We'll drive up there together. I didn't expect to see you here. Why didn't you come upstairs? Because I wanted to see you down here, without your wife. I see. How are you, Commissioner? How are you? Did you come up here to congratulate me, too? We can do without that. Did you have to marry her? What do you mean? Are you sober now? Do I look drunk? I took my last drink a week ago, before we got married. That was one of Mary's conditions. Mary's conditions. I came prepared to meet some of Mary's conditions. Look, Dad, I'm all set, out on my own. I'm getting myself a job. 
outside of being good friends, I, I don't need you, Dad. If you know what I mean, I, that's another of Mary's conditions. Jack? Oh, Mary, come in here. Well, the bellboy said you'd gone downstairs and... Oh. Uh, Mary, uh, this is my father. Dad, uh, this is Mary. How do you do, Mr. Merrick? Uh, Mary, I, I've told Dad our plan, and naturally he's uh, a little surprised. Surprised? Do you realize what you've married, son? Or did she get you before you could find out? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Merrick. We've known each other for two years. Well, you might have studied me a little more closely in those two years. I'd have settled for more than you can possibly get now, Mrs. Haynes. Now, listen, Dad. We don't want anything from you, Mr. Merrick. You don't, hmm? No. What are we waiting for, Jack? Let's go back. Wait just a moment. We're going to be married a long time, and maybe Dad... I mean, if he has anything to say, now's the time to say it. If Dad wants to put his blessing or even his okay on... Go on, Jack. You're doing great. Well, I don't see why we can't show him how we think. The only thing you can show me is an annulment. An annulment? Jack, do you know anything about this person you've married? He knows all about me, Mr. Merrick. Uh, does he know that you have a police record? A record? Well, that's a lie. Tell him, Mary. It's a little distorted. A commissioner will tell you how distorted it is. Well, Commissioner? Well, it's not exactly a record, Mr. Merrick. She was picked up for questioning. Something about her husband. But her name is on the books, isn't it? Yes, it is. But this has very little to do with my marrying your son, Mr. Merrick. I don't quite see that. You'll forgive me, I'm sure. But he is my son. It's his life. My life. I know it's his life. That's one of the reasons I married him. I felt that if someone were behind him to lend him a hand, he might become something more worthwhile. Uh, you were behind that other man you married, weren't you? That thug, that murderer. I was just a kid then. I didn't... Oh, I'm not going to apologize. Jack, I'm leaving here now. Please come with me, if it's only for the sake of the few days we've been married. Well, yes, but Mary, can't we... Maybe we can straighten this out. I don't think so. Are you coming? Oh, but Mary, don't you understand? I, I only thought that this may be our last Jack, chance... please, only because I do love you. I know, Mary, but... You see, all my life, Dad has kind of hoped that... Oh, I, I can't explain it. Darling, I... don't try to explain it. I'm going up and pack now. You'd better stay here. Your father must have a lot to say to you about the annulment. Goodbye. Good evening, Mary. Mr. Rogers, what brings you here? Bad news, I'm afraid. May I come in? Of course. Sit down, Mr. Rogers. I feel very important entertaining my former employer. About Jack, isn't it? Yes. The annulment's gone through, Mary. I heard this afternoon. His father did a good job, evidently. Oh, I... I'm so sorry, Mary. I... I feel... I feel responsible for this. I... You know, I sort of pushed you into it. Well, it's not your fault or Jack's either. He always warned me he had a weak character. <laughs> Wouldn't it be too awful if his child takes after him? Mary. I hope it doesn't. I really hope it doesn't because... It's... Mary. Look at me. When did you know this? What difference does it make? A lot. We could have fought the annulment. No court in the world would annul a marriage. And they'd make him come back to me, wouldn't they? He probably would come to out of pity. Well, I don't want that. Someday he may come by himself. I'll wait for that day. You're not going to tell him? No. Well, it isn't fair, Mary. I think Jack loves you in his own way. It's not fair to him or to you or to the baby. I'll take care of him if it is a him. He's going to be strong. And no matter what happens, he's going to stand on his own two feet. And he's going to learn to be one of us, fighters. You have just heard Act One of That Certain Woman, starring Carol Lombard and Basil Rathbun with Jeffrey Lynn. Now, before our actors come back in Act Two... We have a little game for you during our few moments of intermission. It's making sentences out of words, you know, to test imagination and quickness. For example, a little girl was asked to use Delaware in a sentence, and she answered, what will Delaware to the party? It's not only cute, but to do it fast, you really have to be quick on your feet. Standing right beside me is Miss Jones, who is said to be very smart at these things. She's pretty, too. Miss Jones, I have a little list of words here. You think you can put them into sentences? <laughs> well, I'll be glad to try, Mr. Ruick. All right, here goes. The first word is mention. M-E-N-T-I-O-N. Mention. Um, men shun girls who aren't dainty. 
Well, that's very good, Miss Jones. Now, the second word is very short. Twin. It should be easy. Twin. Hmm. Oh, it's really easy. Twin sure daintiness. Twin sure daintiness. <laughs> that one just gets by, Miss Jones. But you must be leading up to something. You're probably going to tell the ladies in the audience how to ensure daintiness. Well, anyway, the last word is abandon. When you take a Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Bath, put a band on your hair to keep it dry. Thank you, Miss Jones. Just as I suspected, this smart young lady was leading up to the fact that Lux Toilet Soap makes a luxurious beauty bath, a delightful way to ensure daintiness. Its active lather carries away from the pores every trace of dust and dirt. Leaves skin really fresh and sweet. Charming screen stars like Barbara Stanwyck, Joan Blondell, and Irene Dunn tell you it's the best way they know to ensure daintiness. Try a Lux Toilet Soap beauty bath tonight. You'll love its perfume, the delicate, clinging fragrance it leaves on the skin. Now, Mr. DeMille. We continue with That Certain Woman, starring Carol Lombard and Basil Rathbone with Jeffrey Lynn. Two years have passed, and Mary's gone back to work for Lloyd Rogers. Her old friend Amy has come to live with her to take care of the baby while Mary's away. In the kitchen of their two-room flat, Mary sits at the table reading the morning newspaper. There's a story on the front page, a story about Jack Merrick. Mary's read it over and over until the headline sings in her brain. Jack Merrick weds Jean Carson in Paris. Happy couple to honeymoon in South... Friends. Here's your coffee, Mary. It's nice and hot. I, I don't want it, Amy. I'm due at the office now. I'll grab a bite later after I've stopped jittering. I oh, know, honey. Oh, gee, it's sure tough. But your life ain't over yet. There's lots of men around. Married in Paris. Uh, taking a motor trip through the south of France. I guess she's that society girl. I think I've read the name. Oh, Mary, forget him, will you? I wish I could. It's like someone dying after a long illness. <laughs> oh, yes, darling. Now, don't bang your spoon. Amy will take care of you. Bye, sweet. Amy, you remember to get some oil for his scalp? Yes, madam. I will, madam. Anything else, madam? <laughs> Thanks, Amy. It'll all work out somehow, won't it? Morning, Mary. Morning, Mr. Rogers. Why do people work? Do you know? I don't. Not in a day like this. Oh, look at that sunshine. Mary, let's resign. I'm, I'm so tired of this office, I could scream. Take a letter. To whom it may concern. You know the address. I, uh, I positively, definitely, and finally refuse to spend another day in court devoting my energies to... Are you taking all this down, Miss Donald? Mary. What? Mary, I heard this morning about Jack Merrick's marriage. Did you? Imagine he's quite happy, this Jean Carson girl. She must be one of the... Mary. Mary, come here. Life's a kind of dismal affair without a sympathetic and personal interest, isn't it? It could be possible that someone else might take Jack's place. You're very young and, if I may say so, very attractive. I couldn't imagine anyone else. No? Oh, well. Of course, I was thinking of myself. <laughs> Were you, Lloyd? Well, <laughs> it sounds awfully conceited, doesn't it? But I've been pretty unhappy, too. We ought to make a good pair, Mary. You see, my wife and I... Well, that may soon be over. I think both of us are hoping for a divorce, and when it is over, I hope that I might have a chance to make things easier for you. Oh, I'm sorry, Lloyd. I, I guess I'm one of those unfortunate girls you read about in novels. She only loved once. <laughs> sure. But you can't blame me for taking a chance, though. Yes, sweet. And you wouldn't blame me very much if I just went on loving you, quietly like? Oh, Lloyd... I'll take it. Hello? Yes, this is Mary Donald. Who? Oh, Whitaker. What? When? Is he... Was he hurt? Oh, God. Mary, here, sit down. What is it? What's happened? Is it Jack? They had an accident. Their car overturned 50 miles from Paris. They're both in the hospital unconscious. Oh, Lloyd. Mary, get a grip now, a tight one. Mary, will you do as I tell you? I took your life in my hands once before and I made a mess of it. Well, this time I won't. You're going away at once. You're going to take your baby and that woman who lives with you and you're going to White Sulphur Springs for a rest. I can't do this. Yes, you can and you're going to. 
If you don't, you can have a nervous breakdown. I've seen it coming on. I'm going to take care of you, Mary. I don't want you worrying about anything, do you hear? But, but Jack... There's nothing. Nothing you can do for Jack. Whether he lives or dies, that's not in our hands. Mary. Mary, will you go? Yes. Thank you. Then she's all right. Did Dr. Hartman come up there? I see. I'll call again tomorrow, Amy. And you better tell her about Jack. They say he'll live. That might cheer her up. All right. Goodbye, Amy. Take care of her. And uh, then there's the matter of this consolidated case, Lloyd. It comes up Tuesday. Is this the brief you drew up? Lloyd. Oh. Hmm? Oh. Oh, the consolidated case. What's the matter, Lloyd? Matter? Yes. Hmm. Is the practice of law beginning to bore you? Mm-hmm. A little. Maybe we'd better dissolve our partnership. <laughs> if you want to, Tilden. Lloyd, what's wrong? What's on your mind? You haven't been yourself for weeks. Oh, it was two other fellows. What? Never mind. Pretend I didn't say it. I... I think I'm a little tired, Tilden. Will you do me a favor? Go along and see Dr. Hartman. If there's anything wrong with you, he'll fix it. <laughs> get right down to the root of the trouble, eh? <laughs> All right. Let's get on with that brief. All, Doctor? Yes, you can dress now, Rogers. That's all. Well, what's the verdict? Do I live? Yes, you live. Fine. Just how long you live will depend entirely upon yourself. Oh, oh. the catch is that. Mm, your heart's not too good, but that isn't what has me worried. What's the matter with me, Doctor? Frankly, I don't know. There's no medical term to express it. You, you're just burning yourself up, Rogers, faster than any doctor can heal you. Maybe you know what's wrong. Maybe. When brilliant fellows like you lose their grip, they they go pretty fast. You, you'll have to rest. Learn to relax. Thanks. Thanks. How long would you say I had? No one could tell you that. Perhaps five years? Oh, all right, Doctor. I'll count on three. Blow the candles on the cake, darling. One, two, three. One still lit, Mummy. <laughs> Blow. <laughs> oh, gee, birthdays are wonderful, ain't they? I mean, up to four years old. When they get around 40, well, they're not so hard. <laughs> oh, I'll answer. Don't let him eat too much cake. Good evening. Oh, hello, Mr. Tilden. Come in. I'm sorry to disturb you. Is Mr. Rogers here? Mr. Rogers? Why, of course not. What's wrong? Mr. Rogers had a bad spell at the office after you left today. We took him home. He was delirious. Oh, no. The nurse left him for a moment this evening, and now he's disappeared. I thought... I thought he might be here. But why? Because he talked of you constantly. Mrs. Rogers asked me to come here. If he is here and you're hiding Are him... Are you mad? You'd be in a rather bad spot, Miss Donald. What are you talking about? I think you know. You must realize that you and your... Your child have become an obsession with him. Will you please go? If he does come here, I'll telephone him. Good night. Mary, Amy, Mary. did you hear that? Yeah, why didn't you slap him one? I, I don't understand that he... He, Lloyd, he talked about me. Is he in love with you, Mary? Yes, he said he was once. I didn't take it too seriously, but he never mentioned it again. I thought he was just trying to be kind. Oh, poor Mr. Rogers. I guess that's why he's done so much for us. Oh, for you? Yes, for me, Lloyd. Mary. Mary, may I come in? Of course. Lloyd, what's the matter? Here, lean on me. Sit down over here. Oh, Lloyd. Mary, do you mind? I... I had to come to see you. Tell me that it's all right. Of course it is, but you shouldn't... Oh, now, now, please. Don't be an alarmist. That's not like you. Everybody's been... Well, they've been making such a fuss. They... I heard them. They... 
I said I was delirious. I wasn't, Mary. I was never more lucid in my life. I said that I loved you, Mary. And that was true. I've loved you for years. I loved you the day you married Jack Merrick. I told you that once, remember? Yes, Lord. That's... That's why I came here now. Oh, I... I'm sick, Mary. I... I can't be with people I... I don't care about. You can understand that. Can't you, Mary? Yes, Lloyd, I can understand. Just... Just let me stay quietly. Just for a little while. <clears throat> I'm all right. Really, I am. You can stay as long as you want. Thanks. Uh, I've tried to help you, Mary, and... And now you're helping me. Mary... You'll have nothing, nothing to worry about anymore. She has all she wants, her own money. I can, I, I can do what I want with mine. Lloyd, Lloyd, what are you saying? I, I made a will, Mary. It's all yours. Oh, you shouldn't have. Oh, please, have... please, I wanted to. Tell me, tell me that it's all right. Oh. Oh. Well, it's so quiet here, isn't it? Just let me... Close my eyes. Just for a few, few minutes. Mary. Lloyd. Lloyd, listen. Lloyd. Amy! Amy! Read all about it. Line Rogers dead. Why you a gangster's widow? Why you dies a widow's home? Why me? Half a million for Mary. Read all about it. Mystery child. Mystery child. Mystery child. Mystery child. Mystery child. Mystery child. Oh, hey, boy, 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 boy,
Why did you hide him all this time? He's never been hidden. You were just too busy. Oh, don't be bitter. You can't. Not now. Oh, Mary, listen. Could I... Could I steal him for the afternoon? Steal him? Oh, I mean, borrow him for a while. Come on, be a good sport. I am a good sport. Jackie and I are leaving as soon as we can get out. Not now. You can't, Mary. No? No. There's three of us. We've got to fight together. Mary, doesn't this make it all different? I don't think so. You belong to me and you always have. So does this little husky. Definitely. Notice how much he looks like you? Sure, anyone can see it. It's one of the newspapers, isn't it? Well, why should they? When your father annulled our marriage, he hushed it up and made one swell job of keeping it quiet. Was it for me to talk? No, but... Now, I'm going to do some talking. Wait, Jack. We both owe a duty to this boy, right now. You can. Oh, yes, I can. I'm going to talk, plenty. I'm going down and see every newspaper editor in the city. We'll be back later, Mary. We've got a lot to talk about. Have we? Bye for a while. So long there, Husky. Well, Mary, now what? The same thing, Amy. Start packing. We're on our way. For station identification, this is the Columbia Broadcasting System. just heard Act Two of That Certain Woman, starring Carol Lombard, Basil Rathbun, and Jeffrey Lynn. And we'll hear the third act after the short intermission. But now we take a trip to backstage Hollywood, as Mr. DeMille presents our special guest. It's not difficult to locate Edmund Goulding on a Hollywood soundstage. Just look for a gentleman whose face and air spell Ireland, and whose attire on the set, year in and year out, consists of a loose brass-buttoned blue jacket with turned-up cuffs, white corduroy trousers, and a very, very formal boutonniere. In spite of this exhibitionary uniform, Mr. Goulding is a shrinking violet who makes some of the best pictures in Hollywood. Starting out as an actor, he suddenly switched to playwriting, and with Edgar Selwyn, gave the stage a startling hit in Dancing Mothers. As a director, he handled all those stars you saw in Grand Hotel without provoking a single flare of temperament. His latest efforts are White Banners, Dawn Patrol, just completed, and Dark Victory, now in the making. In addition, Mr. Goulding is both author and director of Riptide and the original play from which tonight's drama, That Certain Woman, was adapted. First of all, Eddie, I want to thank you for the attention you showed me once while I was laid up in the hospital. I can't tell you how I appreciated your constant visits. Well, T.B., if a man can't give a friend a little attention... No, 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 Eddie, no. It was more than just a little attention. That cheerful face of yours would breeze through my door three or four times a day. That's real friendship. Well, T.B. Yes, Eddie? I have a little confession to make. I had the room next to you in the hospital. Oh, were you ill? No, I was, uh, I was tired of it all. I was resting up. And it got a little boring, you know, so alone. Well, uh, thanks, Eddie, anyway. Well, you're welcome, T.B., but... Tell me, what ever became of that very beautiful nurse that was tending you? Oh. Oh, so that was it. Hmm. Well, I suggest we get out of the hospital and back to the soundstage. How goes your new picture, Dark Victory? You know, we beat you to it on that one. We did Dark Victory here last spring. And if you hadn't done it in the Lux Radio Theater, the chances are that I wouldn't be directing it now for Warner Brothers. I don't quite follow you. Well, most of the studios knew the story of Dark Victory... But for some reason or other, they shied away from it. Now, when you put it on the air last March, Hal Wallace, the production chief at Warner's, was so impressed, and so was I, that he bought the story for Betty Davis and George Brent. And I only hope we do as good a job with it as you did. Well, it, it couldn't be in abler hands, Eddie. All of which goes to prove, C.B., that we not only use the tangible product of this program at our studios, Lux Soap, but the intangible product is just as highly appreciated. Your beautifully done plays. And that double barrel salute is appreciated. Now may we uh, gossip about uh, that certain woman? Well, I wrote that certain woman under the title of The Trespasser, one of the very first sound pictures, pictures for Miss Gloria Swanson. Mm, it did very well. Yes, it did. And I rewrote it for Miss Betty Davis, and we changed the title to That Certain Woman. They tell me uh, you created that well-known song which was heard for the first time in The Trespasser. 
Love, your magic spell is everywhere. I'm guilty, sir. And it sold about a million copies. I'm doubly guilty, sir. Well, I knew you before that, but I never knew you were a musician. You didn't know I was a choir boy, Mr. DeVille, with honest blue eyes and a cherubic face? Mm, you probably used luck. <laughs> but uh, go on about that song. Well, it happened like this. We needed music desperately in the early days of sound pictures to help take the place of the old-fashioned screen titles. I was looking for a certain kind of strong musical phrase. So to every wandering musician I met on this lot, I'd say, here, come here. This is what I want for the trespasser. Pum, ta da da dum pum, pum, da dum Oh, very, very pretty, Eddie. Very pretty. Well, none of them seemed to be very impressed. So one day I whistled it to Gloria Swanson. She liked it and said, write it down. But we couldn't find a soul to write down the notes. I stayed up half the night whistling it so that I wouldn't forget it. Elsie Janice wrote the words for it, and Gloria Swanson wound up by singing it in the picture. Mm. You whistle to Miss Swanson and automatically become a great composer. Have you whistled successfully since? Yes, sir. I whistled for Miss Davis the other day, a song called, Oh, Give Me Time for Tenderness. Mm. Have you forgotten it? No, we wrote it down. It's in the picture. How does it go? Oh. A gem, Eddie, a gem. <laughs> but, uh... How, how do you get those rhythm effects? Well, sir, confidentially, those are my knees knocking together. <laughs> I sort of play my own accompaniment, and before my knees give way entirely, I'm going to step outside and stop from, from chattering. Goodbye, sir. <laughs> Thanks. Goodbye, Eddie. <laughs> Keep whistling. <laughs> That Certain Woman, starring Carol Lombard and Basil Rathbone with Jeffrey Lynn. It's the following day, and Mary's still in New York, for a court order was presented to her at the boat, an order demanding custody of her child. In fury, she's gone to the Merrick home. And now faces old Mr. Merrick across his library desk. Mary's desperate. The old gentleman composed. Now, please calm yourself, young woman, and listen to me. No, Mr. Merrick, you're going to listen to me. I've taken all that I'm going to from you and everyone else. Now Mrs. Al Haynes is beginning to be herself. I never knew anyone could be so completely heartless. You and your bailiff order. You admit that my bailiff and his restraining order have accomplished my purpose which is to keep you and the boy from leaving the state. Yes, pending action against the custody of my son. That's what it said. Custody of my own son. My grandson. I'm prepared to believe that the boy you have is Jack's son. Since it is obvious that you're entirely unfit to raise the child... Don't say that to me. Don't you dare. I've given Jackie everything I could, everything he needed to grow strong and well, every care, every thought, every experiment of my life. He's everything I have, and you're not going to take him away from me. I intend to ask the court to remove him from further contamination. You talked to Jack about this? My son knows my decision in the matter. He signed the application for the court order? If you doubt its validity, try taking the child out of the state. Just try. I'd like to speak to Jack. May I wait here? My son is not going to discuss this with you. He wants that boy, and he'll get him. Yes, he may at that. So, you're beginning to talk sense now. Very good sense, Mr. Merrick. Yeah, I, I think later on you'll be happy in the knowledge that you did the right thing. The boy will have a real chance in life. Everything that money can give him, uh, you will be free to travel. Have an amusing life. Plenty of money. You needn't go on. We'll handle the whole thing as delicately and generously as possible. Yes, generosity is your long suit, isn't it? Mr. Merrick, you've got all the cards, all the trumps. You're the winner, except for one ace got the one thing that even you can never take away from me, and that's Jack's love for me. You want to take my son away from me? All right. I'll take your son away from you. My son will have his father and his mother, too. I'll go away. I'll travel. I'll have an amusing life, and my husband will be with me. Hello, Mary. Dad, what's this about a warrant, a court order, or whatever you call it? Didn't you apply for it? I did not. If you'll keep out of this, keep out of it. What do you mean, keep out of it? You didn't say anything about any kind of a court order when I talked to you this afternoon. And you didn't know anything about it, Jack? Of course not. Dad, you're all wrong. I spoke to Mary yesterday. She need never have told me about the baby at all. And you need never have told the reporters. Jack, I, I'm only trying to cover you on this. Well, you don't have to. Might as well know right now. When I spoke to Mary last night, I asked if she'd take me back. She said no. But I'm not stopping at that. 
We're going to talk to Jean, lay the whole thing right on the line to her. And you've got to help us, Dad. You broke this up before, but you were wrong. And you've always been wrong. You can't take people's lives and run them the way you run your business. Now, you go home, Mary. Go home and wait for me. I'll be there as soon as I can. Going up, Miss Donald? Please. There's a lady been waiting for you in the apartment, Miss Donald. A lady? Yes, sir. She said she was a friend of yours. I let her in. I uh, wheeled her in. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. I knew you wouldn't want her to wait outside. Hello. Oh, good afternoon. You're Mrs. Merrick, Jack's wife. And you are Mary Merrick. Two Mrs. Merrick's meeting for the first time. Oh, I, I hope you don't mind my waiting here. Oh, I'm glad you did. <laughs> Looks like moving day. Yes, it is. We're on our way to Europe. I was very fortunate to catch you before you left. <sighs> Do you mind if I light another cigarette? Oh, perhaps you'll have one. No, thanks. Jack told me about finding you yesterday. You and the boy, too. It knocked him off his feet. Yes? I believe he's going to tap it out with his father now. Yes. He wouldn't tell me a thing, but I have a pretty fair idea. You see... I've loved Jack ever since I was a child. Have you? Mm-hmm. I've always been teased about it. And I didn't know about you and Jack until after we were married. I've always wanted to meet you. To thank you. For what? You played a great part in the molding of Jack's character. No, not oh, really. Oh, yes, you have, really. You've been gentle and loving and, and so patient. Do you realize what it means for a young, healthy man? Mrs. Merrick... Why do you come here? To ask you to take Jack. To ask me? You must. Why must I? Because he's deeply in love with you. And you love him? Of course. And loving him, you could come and ask me to take him. You could give him up to me. What right have I to hang on to him? Just because I love him. I'm only half a wife. Oh, but isn't love bigger than, than just... It's not bigger than our sons. A man needs a son. And sons need fathers. That's why you've got to take Jack. You've just got to. For the boys. Doesn't it hurt you to say this? Of course it hurts. Nothing fine comes without its pain. You found that out when your baby came, didn't you? Yes, I did. Is there, is there his picture there on the table? May I see it? Caution me. Oh, he's lovely, isn't he? Will you excuse me for a moment? There's someone at the door. Don't mind me. Please. Come in, Jack. Well, Mary, all set. I've just left Dad. He's actually coming over on our side. I'm on my way home now to talk with Jean. Jean is here. Here with you? Why? Because she's a wonderful person, I think. Oh, yes, she is. But, but listen, Jack, we're going to call off all plans, you and I. You're sticking to her, and I'm going away. We've been talking, and I didn't know a woman could be so fine. She's shown me something real about love and living. But, Mary... Don't talk anymore. Please don't. I can't. Take her home with you, Jack. Now. Oh, here he is, Mary. He's all dressed. Are you going out, Mommy? Yes, darling, you are. Mommy's going to stay here. Here, let me do that button. There we are. Oh, Mary, Mary, you can't do this. Shut up. You know where to take him, don't you? Mrs. Jack Mary, 18111. I know where it is. And I still say you're crazy. You don't know what you're doing. Oh, I think I do, Amy. I hope I do. Go on now, please. All right. All right. What about when, when nighttime comes and he starts wanting you? He always does. And that's your job, Amy, and you will do it for me. Just make him believe that I never was. It's just as well. I'm bad luck, man. You're a little man, aren't you, Jackie? Aren't you? You're getting big. Yes, darling. Yes, my sweet. Take him, Amy. Bye. No. No. Come back, Jackie. Here. Here. You know, Mother likes your collar outside your coat. That's better. Go along now, darling. That's all. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mommy. <laughs> Passage to Liverpool, is that right, madam? Yes, please. Uh, will that be for two, madam? No, just one. I'm traveling alone. Hello? 
I can't hear you. Sailed for where? Well, trace her. Put detectives on her. Find out where she is. Never mind the cost. I'll take it. A single sweetness? Hmm. For how long? I don't know. Make it by the day. You are traveling alone, Fräulein? Yes. What time does the train for Naples leave? Signora will have dinner alone. Is that consent? Is considered strange here? No, Signora. Only it passes for one, madam. <laughs> Single sweet? Fräulein is traveling alone. Alone, Signora? Single sweet? Alone, alone, Signora? Passes for one dollar. Alone, Signora? Passes for one dollar. You, uh, you wish a table, Monsieur? Uh, uh, Monsieur, you, you are looking for someone? Yes, yes, there's someone here. I. Oh, there she is. Uh, that lady, Monsieur? Ah, she is always alone, Monsieur. For a long time now, she has been here, and she is always... Don't worry. I don't think she'll mind seeing me. Oh, uh, very good. Do you mind if I sit down? I'm sorry, but... Jack. It's been a long time, Mary. Are you really so surprised to see me? I, I didn't expect it. How did you know where I was? London, Berlin, Naples, Paris. I've always known where you were, Mary. Have you? I never came because... I know you wouldn't want it that way. Thank you. I thought it would be best. It has been the best. Not for you. Oh, I've been busy. You know, traveling, it's, it's like a drug sometimes. You get so used to it. Mary, aren't you going to ask? Ask what? About Jackie. Of course. How, how is he? He's beautiful, Mary. He's a wonderful kid. He gets to look more like you every day. Does he? Is he still the great big sailor? You know, those suits? Sure. You ought to see him ride his bicycle. And he throws a curve that's really got a break on it. Oh, Mary, wouldn't you like to see him again? How Ma is Jean? Jean? You mean you didn't know? Jean died, Mary. Last winter. Died? Oh. She was such a wonderful person. Yes, she was. She thought you were pretty wonderful, too. So do I, Mary. Oh, please. Mary, look at me. You know why I'm here, don't you? Yes, it's, it's just that I can't quite believe it. It's happened so often before in dreams. It's real this time. But Jackie, is it, it's fair to him now? He thinks that... Oh, no, he doesn't. We've never let him forget. We couldn't. He still asks for you, Mary. Night time? Every night of his life. Oh, Jack, how many nights will it be before we're home? That concludes the dramatic portion of tonight's program and gives us the chance to meet Carol Lombard and Basil Rathbun on a much more intimate basis. There's one question in particular, Miss Lombard, that I think our audience would like you to answer. Is your vacation from comedy roles a permanent one, or are we going to see the Lombard brand of humor back on the screen someday? Well, Mr. DeMille, I think an audience likes variety just as much as I do, as any individual parts I played tonight, and in my new picture are the first dramatic parts I've attempted in about five years. I expect to make a few more serious pictures, and then I think it'll be time to laugh again. What are your thoughts on the subject, Basil? Tainted with envy, Carol. I've been slinking and snarling on the screen for such a long time. <laughs> yes, I've been uh, slinking and snarling on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> but when I visit my barber, you know, when I go to visit my barber for a haircut... He keeps asking me if, it, if I'd like it clipped or long around the horns. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't, don't despair, Basil. You've played one sympathetic part tonight, and if you'd like to play another, you may choose any makeup you wish. Now, you wouldn't kid me, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> I know it's Halloween. <laughs> I should say it is, Mr. DeMille, and I had every intention of bringing you a pumpkin for my farm. But, uh... I haven't started the farm as yet, but they say there's nothing like cultivating your own Halloween pumpkins. Must be quite a thrill to watch the nose and the eyes and the mouth get ripe and the little candles inside grow bigger and bigger. Uh, Carol, Carol. You don't grow pumpkins... Oh, well, let it skip. 
But still, on the subject of pumpkins, <clears throat> they're highly desirable, you know, as Halloween. Uh, Halloween for aiding and abetting the lovelorn. Pumpkins? Mm-hmm. Certainly. For centuries, hundreds of Rathbones have been married off by following the simple rules at Halloween. Turn your boots towards the street, put a pumpkin at your feet, tie your stocking around your head, and you'll dream of one you're going to wed. Sounds a little corny to me. Hmm. <laughs> well, it's strictly off the cob, I'll admit. But if you don't like that, you can always make a jack-o'-lantern, go out at midnight, walk around the block seven times, and you'll also bump into your own true love. Ever try it, Mr. DeMille? Yes, once. Some years ago. Only my own true love turned out to be a certain Mr. Finnegan, the policeman on the beat. <laughs> Since then, I've gone in for nothing more strenuous than bobbing for apples. But no gate-stealing or ringing doorbells? Before you force me to confess, Carol, uh, let's change the subject. You might tell us what you think of the Lux Radio Theater. I mean, as a listener. Well, I'll do better than that, Mr. DeMille. I'll tell you what I think of Lux Soap as a user. In syllables of one word, I think it's swell. That goes for your program, too. And now, good night, Mr. DeMille. So long, CB. I hope you get your apple tonight. <laughs> Happy Halloween to you both. <laughs> Two brilliant stars and a grand play await you here next Monday night. Mr. DeMille tells you more about our bill in just a moment. Heard in our cast tonight were Montague Shaw as Norton Merrick, Elizabeth Wilbur as Amy, Lorreen Tuttle as Jean, George Pembroke as Tilden, Galen Galt as Dr. Hartman, Bobby Larson as Jackie, Frank Nelson as Virgil Whitaker, Lewis Merrill as Commissioner Finley, Mary Lansing as Telephone Operator, Sada Cowan as Secretary, James Eagles and Ross Forrester as Newsboys, and Edward Marr, James Robbins, and David Kerman as reporters. Jeffrey Lynn stars soon again with Priscilla Lane in the Warner film, Yes, My Darling Daughter. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studio, where he directed music for Suez. Here's Mr. DeMille. The dramatic problem of a girl who thought she could find no real happiness in love without a successful career comes to the stage of the Lux Radio Theater next Monday night. This situation, which touches the lives of millions, becomes more vital than ever in Ursula Parrott's brilliant story, Next Time We Love. And starring in this romance of an actress and a newspaper reporter are two reigning favorites of the screen, the lovely Margaret Sullivan and the hero of my next picture, Joel McRae. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Margaret Sullivan and Joel McRae in Next Time We Love. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Those of you listening in tonight who have young daughters probably know that this week we're commemorating an important birthday. The birthday of Juliet Lowe, founder of the Girl Scout movement in the United States. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Girl Scout Week. And we know you will want to join with us in congratulating this lively, growing organization. If you haven't a Girl Scout in your home, there's one in your neighborhood. She needs your interest in her. Make friends with a Girl Scout this week. Heard on tonight's program was I've Got a Date with a Dream from My Lucky Star. This program, ladies and gentlemen, came to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, the complexion care preferred by nine out of ten lovely screen stars. Join us again one week from tonight. Be part of the vast audience that gathers each Monday night in this country and in Canada to hear Hollywood's celebrated stars in the best plays of stage and screen, produced by Cecil B. DeMille with music under the direction of Louis Silvers. Until next week, this is your announcer, Melville Roy, bidding you all good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>